I've been very lucky over the last 27 years to attend One Mind's Music Festival for Brain Health as a participant and as a host. My family founded this music festival in 1995 to raise money for One Mind's Brain Health Science and Services programs. And over these years, we've hosted scientists who've talked about the breakthroughs they're making to help people with brain health conditions like, like I experienced, I have schizophrenia, for example, um, and families all over the world with these conditions to have hope uh, for a better future for themselves, their loved ones, and, and the world in general uh, due to the, the new treatments and diagnostics that are being developed year upon year. And I've just been floored every year by the advances that have taken place that have been talked about at the scientific symposium portion of this festival. One Mind's annual music festival for brain health was held last week. Each year, leading scientists come together with acclaimed musicians, world-renowned vintners and chefs, and brain health advocates, very passionate advocates, for the premier event to help One Mind's, help fund One Mind's science and services programs. We're now in our 27th year, and as in, as in all of the others before it, this festival was a smashing success. Here's a look. And today we're thrilled to have with us two amazing scientists who presented on their groundbreaking and innovative work at this year's festival symposium. Later in the program, we'll check in with our team at One Mind Cyber Guide for the mental health app pick of the week. But first, music festival attendees this year received a message from a very special guest, the director of the National Institutes of Health, the NIH, Dr. Francis Collins, gave a virtual address in which he talked about the importance of prioritizing brain health in a post-pandemic landscape. Here he is. Hello to One Mind. How I wish that I was out there with you in the beautiful Napa Valley. Just wanna recognize Garen Staglin and One Mind and all the donors for their leadership in accelerating science, raising awareness and bringing hope to many over now 27 years. COVID has dramatically worsened the lives of those who suffer from conditions like PTSD, anxiety, and depression, and created a whole new population of people who never experienced those conditions, but who have been led there by the stresses of the last year and a half. And we worry that those may last far longer than the pandemic itself. But with partnership with wonderful organizations like One Mind, we at NIH are determined to find ways to provide relief to those millions who suffer from brain disorders through better diagnostics, treatments, and ultimately cures. And I'm really glad that this One Mind Symposium is once again connected to a music festival. At NIH, working with Renee Fleming, we have developed the Sound Health Initiative, and also involving the Kennedy Center, the National Endowment for the Arts, and bringing together music performance, music therapy, and neuroscience to try to accelerate ways of bringing evidence-based applications of music to the healing arts. And we seek to help millions through that, uh, to find relief, maybe to go from a difficult place to something you could call a peaceful, easy feeling, maybe. way that music reaches my soul. 
lifts me up when I'm down. In the dark of night, music opens up the sky. See a million stars all around. I've got a peaceful, easy feeling. That music never lets me down. At a sad day, let your song play a joyful sound. A wondrous neural net, you've got that between your ears. Bring in all the joy that you can find. So let the music rip, take a dopamine to rip, as we gather here to celebrate one mind. I've got a Let your song play a joyful sound. And a sad day, let your song play a joyful sound. One mind, I hope you have a wonderfully joyful sound of science and music today. With me now are two of the nation's leading brain health scientists here to talk about their work and about their amazing talks that they gave last week at the Music Festival for Brain Health. Dr. Deanna Barsh is Chair and Professor of Psychological and Brain Science at Washington University at St. Louis. And Dr. Indre Biscontes, Associate Professor of Psychology at University of San Francisco. She's also an acclaimed author, musician, and opera stage director. Deanna and Indre, welcome, and thank you so much for being with us today on Brainwaves. Thank you for having us. It's great to be here. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Hello. Great to see you both. Um, and thank you for, for speaking last week at the music festival. Really enjoyed your talks. Great. So viewers, uh, thank you for watching and participating with us today. If you have any questions, please feel free to post them in the comment section of this webcast at any time. Deanna, uh, let me start with you. The topic of your Music Festival for Brain Health keynote talk this year was a topic that is very timely and one we've covered extensively on this show in the past. The impact that early adversity has on brain development and on life outcomes. How do early experiences like childhood poverty and stress influence the way that the brain functions and subsequent risk for mental health challenges? Yeah, that's a, you know, it's such an important question. And I think we are starting to learn more and more about exactly how sort of poverty and early adversity gets in the brain and kind of confers lasting risk for brain health challenges. Um, you know, I think a lot of data now in humans is suggesting that this kind of early adversity impacts the development of particular structures in the brain, particularly a, a structure called the hippocampus. Um, which is uh, an, really important for stress responsivity and emotion regulation. Um, and that, you know, the development of the hippocampus is then important for memory, depression, all sorts of, you know, even relevant to developing schizophrenia. And so I think, you know, now the trick is to really understand exactly how it is that early adversity like poverty is translating into changes in hippocampal function and structure. We have some interesting data suggesting that changes in inflammation and other factors may be playing a role, but I think we're starting to hone in on exactly how that operates. Mm, that is fascinating and so important to understand. Kudos for the work that you're doing to try and bring some illumination to that, that very important topic. Indre, uh, your work involves the intersection of art, creativity, and neuroscience. What effect does music have on the brain and on life potential? And does the brain tell us more about music or does music tell us more about our brains? I love that you asked the question that way because it took me at least a decade to understand that in fact, we can learn more about 
the human brain from studying music than vice versa. You know, I think a lot of times we think of music as one thing and one use. And so you hear people say things like, well, music is just so great because, you know, it activates the whole brain. And the truth is, is that if you're, you know, shopping in a store and you're, you know, listening to music or even tuning it out, it's probably not activating very much, if anything at all. Um, and so I like to think of music as not just one thing. It's not a sledgehammer that activates your brain. It's a Swiss army knife that has multiple tools and multiple uses. And each one of them is gonna leave a different signature on your brain. And what's really interesting to me always when it comes to the brain is what can we learn about human behavior? What, what can we learn about being human from understanding the brain? And if the truth is, is, is that it doesn't tell us anything about what it means to be human, then to me, it's not really interesting, right? And so music is just this amazing thing that we use for so many different purposes. We use it to make us feel better. We use it to help us work out. We use it to connect with others. We use it to teach our children the alphabet. I mean, it's just so many different variety of ways that we use music. And so, um, and as an artist, that's something I think about a lot. Like what can I, how can I use music to most effectively do what I want to do? You know, the reaction I want in the audience, you know, do I want them to leave the theater feeling, you know, energized in order to act, um, to go vote or to, you know, change the world? Do I want to give them comfort and catharsis after a difficult time? Um, do I want them to learn something new, you know? And so, so we use music in these different purposes. We know that the brain is activated differently in each of these different conditions. And now we're in this really exciting time at the intersection of music and health, because we're also learning how specific musical interventions leave their signatures on the brain and even help rewire the brain um, after certain forms of injury. Uh, so that's, I, I feel like we're, we're really in an exciting time when we can start asking the really interesting questions, not just say, yeah, sure, you know, music activates the whole brain. <laughs> no, that is really exciting. You know, I, I remember asking a friend of mine, you know, what is your favorite kind of music? And of course, the answer is it's not one thing. I mean, it's so many different types of music for different moods or different situations in life, like you're saying. And um, I also remember a presentation I gave in which I talked about how um, uh, I, at one point in my life, I was listening to a lot of this new age music and a lot of it was very dark and moody. And uh, did, that, did that have more of an effect on me listening to it? Uh, did that make me more depressed? Or was it a sign that the fact that I was listening to it, uh, an insight into how I was feeling at the time, maybe it's a two-way street. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I absolutely think it is. And I think that, you know, sometimes we gravitate towards music that, it, you know, gives us the same mood that we're already in and we don't want to listen to happy music. And sometimes, you know, being moved by sad music makes us feel happier. Um, and I think we're learning more and more about that. But I'm also really excited, you know, and, and to hear uh, Deanna's thoughts about this is specifically um, you know, we're, we're starting to see that in serious mental illness, in fact, there's a study that One Mind really sponsored, which is the scoping review of the work out there on um, the impact that music can have on serious mental illness and the ways in which we can be used. And, you know, just like any other use of music, it has to be specific both to the individual and to what it is that, how we're trying to help them, right? So, you know, music can be used as torture under the wrong circumstances, right? So it's not just, you know, it's, it's, it's not just a, a one-way street, but, but I think, you know, we are in this time when we're starting to recognize that it can have a really big effect, even in, you know, serious mental illnesses like schizophrenia or depression, bipolar disorder. Here, yeah. here. Deanna, do you have any thoughts about that? Any, yeah, uh, no, I mean, I think it's or... a, a great point because I think that, you know, for a lot of long time, I think a lot of the field had a hard time thinking about the ways in which, um, you know, I'll call it the environment writ broadly can impact the brain, right? Or how psychological processes can impact the brain. The assumption was always that it was unidirectional, right? Like something happens in the brain and then that alters behavior or perception. Um, and, and we know that's not true now, right? And so thinking about the ways in which music, either in the moment or over long periods of time, may be shaping brain activity, brain connectivity, changing connections, making new connections that can have longer lasting effects. Like we now know that, that that's possible. 
I mean, it's almost akin to thinking about like mindfulness interventions, right? Like I think, you know, we know that those kinds of interventions can have a lasting impact on brain structure and brain function just in the way that I, that music can too. Um, and so I think that offers all kinds of really interesting new avenues for treatment that haven't been explored before. And if I could just say one more thing to that end, um, specifically Deanna and your work, is that what we find is that there are some critical periods or sensitive periods in a person's life when music plays a huge role. Mm -hmm. And adolescence is one of those moments as Absolutely. they're finding you yeah. know, their place in the world. And a person who you know, has, uh, you know, sometimes I think of schizophrenia as almost a developmental you know, illness, because it comes online in late adolescence and, and early adulthood, right around the time when we think about, um, when we think the music that we're going to love for the rest of our lives, usually we encounter it in that period. So I just wondered, you know, your, if you had any thoughts about, you know, people who are going through adverse childhood events, and whether, you know, whether there's, you know, what role music might play in terms of helping them overcome some of the challenges in their home life, um, you know, if that's, if that's where the adverse child events are happening. Yeah, I mean, I think it could play kind of two roles, right? I mean, there's sort of the more direct role. So think as an example, I mean, there's a lot of kinds of childhood adversity people can experience, but imagine you're living in an environment that is very chaotic, chronic stressors, right? And it's, and, and maybe, you know, it's such a challenging thing that your family and caretakers aren't able to provide you with some of the sort of uh, help with emotion regulation or soothing that is really so critical during some of those critical developmental periods. And so you can imagine music because it can have very sort of soothing and regulatory properties being something that can be really helpful to kids when they're in these kind of stressful and chaotic environments where they're having difficulties with their own emotion regulation. I mean, we know that that plays an important role, for example, for children who have autism or other you know, challenges where they have difficulties regulating their emotions. So it can play that role sort of in the moment. You know, you can imagine helping kids to learn to use that as a tool when they're in sort of acute stress or trauma. But also over time, thinking about helping kids, you know, who maybe have experienced chronic trauma or adversity and are now, you know, working on, you know, their mood regulation, their other kinds of things, using music as a tool, again, to help kind of reshape and rewire the brain in ways that are beneficial. Hmm. Yeah, that is fascinating. Um, I like to use music when I'm feeling down to inspire myself to feel motivated again to do things like last night as I was getting ready for bed I was listening to one of my favorite songs by Bruce Springsteen Land of Hope and Dreams and uh, as you can guess by the title it's a very kind of upbeat motivating inspiring song and uh, it reminded me that there is in fact hope there is in fact joy and there is potential in life you know and I got really excited you know as I was listening to that that uh, th there's work to be done and I, I, can, I can engage in that and so it kind of a big pick me up to hear that song and I think it's important to have those touchstones those like artistic touchstones for, for each of us that we can turn to in times of um, like disillusionment or or feeling adrift uh, to kind of re, re um, connect us to what really matters to us I think yeah yeah and I think you know someone like Bruce Springsteen who's talked openly about depression and you know the way that he struggled with that to they we could we see these artists as emotional role models and through their music through the way that they capture the human experience I feel like we also can find kind of you know tools that can we can find direction to how to get ourselves out of those difficult moments um, I think they actually play an outsized role in our in our society in terms of helping us learn to regulate our own emotions yeah it's it's great you're we're calling you're calling attention to that right now uh, I hope people recognize that and, and value music and arts for what they're worth um, Deanna back to you uh, we've touched on this a little bit already, but festival attendees at the music festival have long been interested in hearing about depression and schizophrenia research and the latest uh, findings. Uh, we, what have your extensive studies into cognition, emotion, and brain function revealed about neuropsychiatric conditions and the risk of developing one of these conditions? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think, you know, this actually touches on something that Indra already alluded to a little bit earlier, which is you know, we're really starting to see that 
um, the all of these disorders are neurodevelopmental, right? In the sense that um, it's it you know we start to see the emergence of things pretty early in life um, that are at least risk factors for the likelihood of having brain health challenges later in life. And I think that for many years, people didn't believe, for example, that kids could have early signs of depression or you know, didn't believe that kids could be starting to have some experiences that might be sort of foreshadowing having you know, challenges with schizophrenia. And I think the data is really starting to show that that's not true, that you can see some of these things emerging in kids quite young that there may be interventions that we can do earlier on that might, I always think of it as trying to shift people back on a healthy developmental trajectory so that they can have all the experiences that are really helpful for kind of optimizing brain development. And so just take as an example, like if you're a child who develops depression early in life, and we see that kids as young as four can develop clinical depression and even can become suicidal, well, if you have a child who's spending their whole developmental period, childhood, school age, adolescence, depressed, imagine how that impacts their ability to interact with all the other things in their environment that are likely to be so important for brain development, friendships, academics, families, music, art, you know, things that, that kids who are not experiencing depression may be engaging with. So if you can look at early intervention and kind of help shift them back on a trajectory where they can get some of those healthy developmental experiences that might help them develop resilience against depression or psychosis later in life, we're going to be far better off. And I think this is particularly important. I mean, it's important to say this about depression and to recognize that young children can be depressed and that there are effective treatments, but especially for schizophrenia or kind of early, what we might call psychotic-like experiences, you know, there are kids, 9, 10, 11, 12, who have some pretty distressing experiences. And I think too frequently in the past, we've dismissed them. Oh, they'll be transient. They'll go away. It's not, it's a, you know, it's typical development. And that's absolutely true for some kids. But for other kids, it's really, again, foreshadowing challenges in school with friends, you know, all kinds of things. And whether or not those kids would go on to develop schizophrenia, to some extent, it doesn't matter because they're in pain and distress now, and it's it's impairing their function now, and it means there's something we need to do about it now, rather than sort of dismissing it and saying, oh, well, we've got to wait and see if they develop this other thing that's even worse, right, as opposed to looking at what we have here, because those experiences are associated with the same kinds of variation in cognition, brain structure, you know, other factors that we see in adults who do have schizophrenia or depression, suggesting that it's really part of a continuum that can manifest much earlier in life than we used to think. Yeah, it's important to recognize that early intervention can really make a difference for, for a young person. Mm -hmm. And prevention as well can, uh, yeah, either at an, at an, excuse me, at an even earlier stage, um, make a difference to changing that trajectory something we, we talk about a lot at One Mind. Yeah. And speaking of uh, early intervention and prevention, I think that um, when you intervene early, it's ideal not to use, uh, a, a, it's ideal to steer toward less invasive interventions uh, yes. that have fewer side effects because um, there's a stigma attached to the side effects as well as the, um, the debilitation of the side effects themselves. And a better outcome if you can avoid those with more um, kind of perhaps psychosocial or lifestyle interventions that are healthy environments, perhaps. So mm -hmm. this brings me to my next question, Indre. Um, one of your many areas of interest is digital technology. Mm -hmm. What have you learned about the effect that technology, increasingly ubiquitous in our lives, is having on our brains, on our creativity, and on our behavior, especially for young people? So, you know, I was first approached um, by a company that makes online video lectures to do a course on how digital technology shapes the brain. And I was going to shoot off a quick email and say, well, I just don't think it does. I mean, there's no way that like a technology that's been around for maybe, you know, a couple of decades is going to have a, an effect on a brain that's been evolving for millions of years. And then I was like, well, maybe I should just delve into the research a little bit more. 
And sure enough, uh, I became so convinced that there really is something there to talk about. Um, but I think it's we often think of it as just uh, just an evil thing. So digital technology just has a negative effect on the brain. And so you know we see kids, for example, who have you know ADHD or you know other other neural differences, and they just want to spend all their time on a screen. And then we say that that's bad. And that maybe it's even causing, you know, this this problem, you know, in some of their behaviors, um, when it's just simply not true. Uh, that you know, there are there sometimes the screen is a way of self soothing um, in a person who's developmentally different, and we need to recognize that. But just to say that it doesn't have any effect, even on a neurotypical brain, I think also is missing the point because ultimately, what a lot of digital technology tools do is nudge behavior in little minuscule ways. But the brain is essentially a repository of all of your experiences and your behaviors. So what you do today is going to set up what you will be able to do tomorrow. So over time, if you spend more and more time in a particular using a particular digital tool, that will have a significant effect on your brain, which might not be irreversible, um, but I do think it has an impact. And so like one example I give um, is, is something that um, Carl Newport talks about, which is like this deep work idea, um, or even just, you know, reading on a screen versus reading a book. Like if we look at our eye movements, when we're looking at a screen, we actually just, you know, we jump from place to place. Um, whereas if we're sitting down and reading a physical book, we're doing a lot more imagination, we're doing a lot of more deep work in terms of what, you know, how our understanding of the material. So if we only spend our time reading on screens, we're going to have, you know, different abilities later on um, than if we if we sort of, you know, spend our time doing both reading off screen and on screen. So that's a long, you know, preamble to say, essentially, yes, digital technology has affected our brains because it's affected our behavior. It's affected what we do and how we do and how we spend our time. Um, but we also can be mindful of that and we can make choices uh, that can lead us to an optimal you know, solution. And if it weren't for digital technology, this pandemic would have been way more devastating for a lot of people. I mean, you know, we, we have, you know, because of digital technology, it, it's, it's actually had less of an impact than it could have. But we also see that for a lot of, um, there are a lot of intangibles, say for, for me, most um, obviously, both as a professor who had to you know, do remote teaching and as a mother of two young kids who had to go to Zoom school, um, I can definitely see that there are intangibles in the in-person teaching environment that I think we really underestimated. And now we see like there is, we are social creatures. We learn from body language. We learn, we get, are motivated from being in the same room with each other. And there's some things that just don't transfer to the digital environment. So anyway, it's a lot to say, but you know, the, the, the short uh, answer is that it certainly affects who we are and our brains and our behavior. Um, and the question is, you know, how? Andrea, I'm curious, like, you know, because I think this is, I mean, this is a question we get all the time because it's, we're di trying to dive pretty deep into measuring electronics use in the adolescent brain and cognitive development study. And um, do you have sort of suggestions that you give to families or parents about sort of how to engage protectively with their kids and their technology? Because you're absolutely right. It's like, it's easy to demonize it, but there's a lot of positive aspects of it too. Yeah, I mean, I, I tend to think, you know, these are these are things that, um, you know, every every parent kind of is told or knows intuitively that um, if we just use the screen as a babysitter and we don't pay attention to what the child is doing, then we are setting ourselves potentially up for problems that, you know, we maybe didn't anticipate. So that's the first thing is 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 um, monitoring and, uh, you know, just like we all sense like the addiction to our screens. I also think that parents model a lot of behavior and if they're constantly, um, you know, not listening to their kids because they're looking at their phone, the kids are going to pick up on that. Um, but I mean, this the sort of short advice I give is that we need to teach our kids moderation. We need to teach them 
how to put down the screen uh, when it's time to put down the screen because they're not capable of doing that themselves. They don't have a functional frontal lobe, right? So they have a lot of trouble predicting the future and you know sacrificing the now for the future, right? But we as adults, hopefully with a prefrontal cortex intact, we can see that if you spend all your day on a screen today and you don't go to the park, that's gonna have a, a, you know, a negative impact in, in a lot of ways. So I think teaching them, um, first of all, time limits on the screen so that we, we don't have the problem of um, you know, not going outside and not you know, moving their bodies. Um, but then you know, also looking at the screen as um, the level of interactivity on the screen is gonna, is gonna impact um, you know, how that screen is used. And so like, you know, there are educational tools that the kids have to do something in order to, um, you know, for, for the, for the next thing to happen versus just passive viewing. So I would say, you know, you don't want to err just on the passive viewing side, um, because that's entertaining, but that's not really educational. You know, on the other hand, there's also this problem of gamification. So a lot of these educational tools and apps gamify learning. And the and so the, I, I tend to tell parents, like, stay away from an exclusively gamified educational environment because learning ultimately has to be intrinsically motivated. The child has to learn that learning is fun, not that it's going to get you to the next level in the video game or the, you know, gold coins are going to come down if you, you know, spell the word correctly. Um, so I would just say that, that, like, you know, monitor the kinds of activities that your child is doing online. Make sure that there is a balance between the kind of gamified learning environment and just, you know, learning for curiosity's sake. Um, uh, and then finally, make sure there's also time where they go outside, if not for their bodies, just for their eyes, you know, so they develop distance viewing. So it's, you know, they're not just always right here in front of their screens. Wow, that's wonderful and very well, uh, very comprehensive advice that I think will help a lot of parents and families to because the age old, um, you know, principle of moderation is something that's been taught for you know, thousands of years. And it's, it's something that is just as applicable today. And I think it, if you can teach kids that, that helps them to apply that principle in so many aspects of life going forward um, through executive function, through like the ability to moderate their behavior. Uh, yeah, fantastic. Um, thank you. We're talking today with two of the nation's thought leaders in brain health science who joined us for this year's 27th Annual Music Festival for Brain Health. Dr. Indri Viscontas is Associate Professor of Psychology at the University of San Francisco. She's also a musician, an author, and an opera stage director. And Dr. Deanna Barch, Chair and Professor of Psychological and Brain Science at Washington University at St. Louis. Viewers, don't forget, we wanna hear from you. If you have any questions or comments or thoughts to post on this webcast today, please do so. And if you have any um, one out there who you know, who you think might benefit from the uh, insights that are being shared by Andre and Deanna today, please share this webcast with them. Back to you, Deanna. What inspired you to go into the field of neuroscience? What, what inspired you to focus your, your life and your career study on the role of human thought, emotion, and behavior for our lives? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, two things. Um, so I actually knew from the time I was in high school that I wanted to be a psychologist, at least. Um, and my cat is having a, <laughs> a hating in the background here. Um, I, I served as a peer counselor in high school. And, you know, I always kind of knew that I was really fortunate um, to, you know, do well in school, to have a loving family, to have a lot of advantages, and that I, you know, interacted with peers who did not always have all of those same advantages. And so I thought, oh, I want to go and do something and, you know, be helpful. And, and, you know, my own brother had dyslexia and other challenges growing up, and I thought he could have used more help in high school. So I went to college, not knowing all the options that you could do with sort of psychology. And, you know, learned about research and getting involved in research. And then I uh, took a year off after college and became a case manager for the chronically mentally ill in inner city Chicago. So I spent a year working with people who had, um, you know, serious mental illness and, and in a kind of a pilot program, helping to stabilize their housing and other sorts of things. And I have this distinct memory of working with a young man who had developed schizophrenia in his freshman year in college. And 
it had really had an, you know, altered his pathway of what he thought he could do and he could accomplish in his life. And it just like really struck me that, you know, I was at this place where I was getting ready to apply to grad school and do all these things. And here was this young man who, you know, was having these brain health challenges and that as much as I wanted to help him individually, there weren't really good treatments. We didn't really understand why now and what could we do to prevent. And that kind of led me to think, maybe I could have a bigger impact if I went into research and tried to help identify causes, you know, timelines, mechanisms for early intervention. And so that really pushed me to go back to graduate school and focus more on research and neuroscience um, because I thought maybe that would be a way to have kind of a broader impact and give back to the field. Thank you for sharing that inspiring story. I've always admired neuroscientists and brain health scientists in general, like, like you, like the two of you, uh, for the work that you do uh, to, to help folks who, who, like me, experience these, 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 set, these setbacks and challenges in our lives. Uh, and so thank you very much for your dedication. Uh, and Indre, uh, you're something of a Renaissance woman. You give lectures, host science and music podcasts and create content for both television and radio. And I'm a fan of your podcast, by the way, as I mentioned before. Uh, tell us about your artistic path as an opera singer, then opera director, and how that led you ultimately to cognitive neuroscience. And then what drove your passion for science communication? Sure. Well, first off, I want to say I had almost the exact same experience as Deanna um, in my like second year as an as an undergraduate, where I worked uh, at the Clark Institute, it was called then, and realized that I could make as a scientist a much bigger impact doing research than as a clinician at the time. So I that resonates with me. But in terms of my artistic path, um, so it, it started out very early on. My mom's a choral conductor, and so we were always singing. And I always thought like you know, from the outset, I'm, I'm my mom's the big cheese. And so I'm probably a good singer. And when I was really young, like probably six or seven, I auditioned for the premier children's chorus in Toronto. And I was so soundly rejected. I mean, I didn't even make it into the feeder choir. <laughs> into this. And it really, it really affected my self-esteem when it came to my singing. Um, and so I auditioned for this other choir that was considered sort of like, you know, that's where all the riffraff went. Uh, it was the Canadian Children's Opera Chorus. And I found my people. I mean, these were the kids who like could not sit still, whose voices stood out, you know, who just were like, you know, kind of the misfits, the theater kids. Um, and that's where I recognize that, that, you know, opera is where I belong, not, you know, choral singing, <laughs> which is you know, this other pathway. And so, you know, and then when I was in high school, I discovered Oliver Sacks and, you know, his writing was very influential for me. Um, so when I went to college and, and actually throughout, um, you know, my graduate work, I, I really saw neuroscience um, as a way to fund my singing habit, uh, that it was a way that I could continue to, to, to sing and develop my, my voice and, and try to, you know, be a professional opera singer while still paying the bills and making some kind of contribution to society. And so when I finally got my PhD, I decided to just leave academia and work as a freelance singer. Um, and as I was doing that for a number of years, I started to realize that what I had learned in my graduate work, studying the neuroscience of learning and memory was really applicable to how I was training to be a singer. And that that wasn't talked about enough in the musical training world. And so I started to apply the neuroscience of learning and memory to help develop more effective practice strategies. And it was in that kind of zone too, where I started to realize that if I could communicate science to the public, um, that's something I could do better than, you know, I could do research. So I could, you know, it was like, that was, that was a way that I could use use my skills as a performer for the good of science. And so that, that became very appealing to me. So in addition, when I was freelancing as a musician, I also started doing some science communication stuff, became more passionate about it as I, you know, as I, as I learned to hone my skills and, and I realized, you know, that's something that I could make an impact on. And it's really enjoyable for me too. Um, but in terms of then like moving to stage direction, sorry, this is a long answer to your very short question. Um, you know, that didn't come until... Um, until I was working with this conductor friend of mine and I was as a singer and she was, she was conducting and, you know, she would say, 
you know, Indra, you're, you're a good singer and I love working with you and I'll keep working with you, but, but really you're a director. And I was like, no, I don't know anything about directing. Like I've, you know, I've never done that before. It's, it's not who I am. And she's like, okay. Um, and then she kept saying it and kept saying it and kept saying it. And then she said, um, you know, I think we should start an opera company together and I think you should direct. And I was like, well, I'll give it a try. And the opera that I directed was called The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, which was based <laughs> on an Oliver Sacks case study. And I was hooked. I mean, it was like no turning back at that point because I realized that like, I didn't have to go through all the stress of actually performing. <laughs> I could leave that to the singers. Um, and yet I could bring all the knowledge I have about you know neuroscience and human behavior into one artistic, um, you know, vein. And so, so for the last few years, I've sort of transitioned into directing operas and it's just been, you know, really a, a kind of just wonderful way for me to channel that artistic passion um, and still leave room for, you know, the neuroscience and the research life that I also really enjoy. What a way to use all the different parts of your brain, just like we're talking about music and do and it's not even <laughs> singing you know it's, it's doing something that's more direction directing you know that's 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 awesome that you bring so much joy and 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 appreciation to people's lives right through the art that you create uh, but also educate people at the same time i mean the man who took his wife for a hat is a moving story um about a real phenomenon that happens to so many people and helping people you know get a a sense of that from a story is just a powerful way to help change our world perception of you know the need to help people and appreciate people like, like, like who experience these things. Um, so hats off to you. Thank you. I mean, I, that's one thing I, you, I recognize very early on is that if you want to change, you know, people's views about something, you have to tell a good story, right? We know that in, in science communication 101, right? You, you got to have a good story. And so, yeah, to me, the man who was took his wife for a hat is a great example of, you know, talking about a very little known phenomenon about Alzheimer's disease that, you know, it's not just about, you know, forgetting, there's this whole visual component to it um, that, that also happens. And so, yeah, I, I mean, I, I so it's, it's, to me, storytelling through music, through science um, is really what I find most exciting. Fantastic. And I, I, as I said, I love the stories that you tell on your podcasts. Uh, and then Deanna, back to you. Um, have your studies into the brain mechanisms underlying schizophrenia and depression and other mood disorders, have there yielded any hope in regard to the possibility of prevention at a large scale? Is this something we're likely to see down the road in addition to new therapies? And, and what might such preventions look like in our world, in our society? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, let me, I think the answers are slightly different for the two of them. Um, I think with depression, I do think there is good reason to believe that we could think about at minimum, very, very early intervention and even prevention. I think we know that, you know, at least for some people with depression, you know, there's a, a big component of difficulties with emotion regulation that can start very early in life. And we have data from work that I've done with my colleague, Joan Luby, looking at a psychosocial intervention where we kind of harness the caretaker environment to help the caretaker and the child work together to learn how to help the child better regulate their emotions, both to upregulate positive emotions, which is a key part of things, and to downregulate negative emotions. And that can be very effective. And what's really interesting about it is it's effective both for the parent so it improves the parent's own mood because it's really challenging if you have a child who's suffering, right? And is in distress. So it helps the parent's own mood. It helps them learn how to parent their child in terms of emotion regulation. And it helps the child develop better emotion regulation skills. So we've now been looking at whether this is something that we can start to bring into the community, like into schools, um, you know, and. Uh, and Joan has really been leading more of the psychosocial part and I'm the person who's typically helping to measure brain changes as a function of these things. But in particular, she's been looking at, can you make sort of shorter, more focused interventions, even ones that teacher might, teachers might be able to administer or support in classrooms as well. So again, thinking very much from the perspective of like very early intervention or prevention, starting that early in life. Um, and, you know, I'm not gonna be, 
Pollyanna and say that that will prevent people ever developing depression or kind of any form of depression, but it, it, you know, we have at least preliminary evidence that that can be very helpful and it can last for a while. Um, I think in terms of schizophrenia, the hope is there, but we still have more work to do. Um, you know, what I am very optimistic about, you know, I've been in this field pretty long time now, like 20 some odd years. And it used to be, we always thought everybody who developed schizophrenia was always gonna have, you know, a, a, a poor course, they were not gonna get better, you know, and we now know that's absolutely not true. And it's definitely not true when you could have, you know, early and um, multifaceted interventions. So interventions that involve family support, you know, support for people staying in school or work, you know, appropriate medications that don't create too many side effects. And so think about translating that back earlier in life. If we start to know that we can pick up the signs and signals of which kids are heading down that pathway, can we think about sort of multi-pronged interventions early on that are going to help reduce stress? Because we know there's a variety of stressors that impact, you know, a bunch of stuff, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, if I want to get fancy with medical terms and brain development, right? Um, you know, family support and support for people to be able to stay in their sort of educational pathway, even when they're struggling, because if they drop out of that, again, they're going to miss skills. It's going to be hard to come back. But I will say it, it takes the will of our society to be willing to develop and fund these interventions. There are other societies, I look at Australia, which has done a much better job than the US in terms of early mental health support and treatment for kids, um, because they have deemed that to be important to the society as a whole, because they know how harmful it is for society, how much lost you know, contributions from these kids, right? Um, and so part of me now wants to become like an advocate, you know, in terms of, you know, changing public policy, because as we discover these things, we have to have a way to actually translate them into the real world and, and actually doing something about it. Yeah, absolutely. That's something that I care deeply about and have advocated for at the state level here in California. I'm excited to see in California, there's recently been a a $4 billion um, allocation of our budget to mental health services and, and evidence-based services, which uh, a large portion of that hundreds of millions is dedicated for early intervention for serious mental illness in young people. Um, so uh, it's advocacy can pay off and yeah. uh, I'm, I'm glad you're interested in that as well. Yeah. Um, and I hope podcasts, webcasts like this may help other people get interested as well. Yeah. Andre, back to you. The trajectory of the pandemic in the U.S. has shown us that catastrophic consequences can result with, due to a lack of um, enough understanding and appreciation for science. How can we generate more enthusiasm for the study of science? And how do you think our world will be different when everybody uh, can see science as cool and fun? Well, I mean, I think I, I think I, I'm at the point where I feel like we have to get beyond seeing science as cool and fun. We have to see science as fundamental to our survival. You know, science works and it's going to save lives and it saves lives. And so we, you know, I think the problem is not that people don't see science as being particularly, you know, fun. The problem is, is that it's the, there, there's been a politicization of certain aspects, especially in this pandemic. And that's the problem. And so I don't know that the scientists are the ones to fix it. I think the scientists have to do what they do best, which is science and continue to create uh, tools that can help save lives, can help, you know, fight climate change, can help essentially our, you know, species survive on this planet. And then it's going to be up to the politicians to stop politicizing this, the science and instead, you know, look beyond just their next uh, election and to the future of humanity and recognize that, you know, this is what science is for. <laughs> um, and in some ways, I think actually this pandemic has shown that science can be incredibly helpful, right? We got to a vaccine very, very quickly. And we're all now armchair epidemiologists, but we also recognize how complicated 
um, epidemiology is. And so, you know, so, so I think actually the scientists just need to keep doing what they're doing and we need to be able to publicize what it is that they're doing and we need to continue to stay the course. So, you know, example from Deanna's work is to continue to show, to overturn people's myths and misconceptions about these serious mental illnesses and this idea that, you know, it's a, it's a life sentence and you're not gonna get better, you know, if, if they continue to provide evidence that actually there are treatments and tools and interventions that are effective, that's gonna do a lot more than anything else. Cause ultimately, you know, people wanna get better. So I, I say, that's what I would say. Yeah, that, thanks for spreading hope and for speaking the truth. Um, uh, I actually, uh, in the musical field, I wrote a song called Horizons Left to Chase about schizophrenia and recovery, and I performed at a few different venues around the U.S. in 2017, but there's a line in it that goes as part of the chorus, been diagnosed with schizophrenia, guess what, it's not the end of you, <laughs> and uh, I think that's an important thing for people to understand, especially if they've been newly, newly diagnosed, right, there's so many horizons left to chase. Um, finally, here we go, Is we're here at time for the lightning round. <laughs> so quick questions, quick answers, one person at a time. We'll start with Deanna first and circle around for Indre's answers to these five telling questions. Um, Great. I can steal some of her answers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Just cite your source. <laughs> okay. Deanna, let's start with you. You ready? Yep. Okay. What helps you cope when you're going through a tough time mentally? So being with my family, that's definitely one of the most important things. My husband and my two girls, that's where I usually go if I'm having a rough time. Fantastic. What type of music, literature, or art do you turn to when you're feeling down? So I will usually go and listen to either 80s <laughs> dance music, which is uh, always good to cheer me up, um, or read a good mystery novel that will distract me. Wonderful. What's a hobby, activity, person, or animal that helps you unwind and de-stress? And maybe you just mentioned that, but. Yeah, well, also my cats. I have two pandemic kitties and an older cat and they are big snugglers. So that's a great, great way to unwind and de-stress. Great. Your cat died in the background look, look snuggly. <laughs> <laughs> Did you discover any new books, films, or television media or music that particularly inspired you during the pandemic? Well, I wouldn't necessarily say inspired me, but certainly distracted me. Um, you know, uh, I kind of got really into cooking shows, which was very soothing uh, and gave us ideas for cooking more at home. Yeah, I love to cook too. It, it's a soothing thing to do for sure. And what, what gives you hope? So this is going to sound really corny, but I, I, it's absolutely true. So I think the younger generation, I mean, I look at my kids who are just, I am biased, but I think they're amazing people who are doing all sorts of things to help the world. But then I look at all the undergraduates and graduate students that I am really fortunate to work with, and they're just so smart and enthusiastic and creative and, it, you know, seem to have sometimes what feels like much better ideas and solutions for how to fix the world. And so that really gives me hope looking at them. Yeah, fresh eyes are so important to look at old problems that, that plague us today. Thank you. Uh, uh, Andre, it's your turn. Are you ready? Sure. Okay. What helps you cope when you're going through a tough time mentally? So usually it happens when I'm particularly stressed. So um, ironically, I need to slow down. So when I can just take some time, slow down, take something off of my calendar and appreciate what I have. Um, do a little gratitude work that tends to make me feel better. Mm, I love that. What type of music, literature, or art do you turn to when you are feeling down? Well, you'd think it would be music, but it's not. Uh, music's too work-related for me. Um, so I, I like to look at, um, watch shows that have humans overcoming obstacles, like the Formula One series, uh, that really <laughs> makes me feel a lot better. Uh, at least I don't have to drive one of these cars at like, you know, ridiculous speeds into <laughs> on these tracks. And the vicarious thrill. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, a hobby activity or person or animal that helps you unwind and de-stress. Yeah, I love running and listening to a podcast while I do that, like uh, This American Life or, you know, some of these great podcasts that have a storyline to them. Um, so, yeah, that's what I do is I go for a run. 
Okay, that's that's great. Uh, did you discover any new books, films, television, or music, or, or, or podcasts that particularly inspire you uh, during the pandemic? Yeah, I feel like I discovered a lot. Um, so I was really moved by the um, by the social justice movement, especially uh, the aftermath of the George, George Floyd um, killing. And so I started reading fiction by Black authors, so N.K. Jamieson and Colson Whitehead, a number of others. Um, and I found, you know, some really great books that I adored. Um, and also there are a couple of films that I normally wouldn't have watched that really have changed my approach to a lot of things, especially um, when it comes to neurotypical and developmental differences. So two that come to mind are The Sound of Silence um, about deafness and The Reason I Jump, uh, which is about um, autism. And so th those two were great films. Thanks for recommending those. I'll check those out. And what gives you hope? Well, I'm going to uh, plagiarize Deanna's comment there and also say both my kids um, uh, and my students at USF, uh, they, I find that they're not only, you know, really thoughtful, but they also have so much empathy. You know, they really are committed to building a society that is inclusive and socially just and just the kind of society that I want to live in. Um, so that I find that really helpful. That warms my heart to hear. Fantastic. Thank you, Indre. Thank you, Deanna. And I really appreciate all that you share with us today. Uh, let's take a break for a moment and say, when it comes to mental health help in the palm of your hand, the market offers many choices in digital apps that can possibly help. But which app might be right for you? Our team at One Mind Cyber Guide is here to give us the review of one option amongst the many choices. Take it away, Cyber Guide team. Hi, I'm Kathy Chang, and I'm a research assistant at One Mind Cyber Guide. Mental health apps offer a lot of benefits and can be a great tool in your mental health toolkit. Apps are usually low cost, and there are lots of free apps on the app stores. Apps can be used on the go. You can use them on your commute, at home, in school for even 5 to 10 minutes at a time. Having an app on your phone means that you can get care almost anywhere and anytime. They can be used quickly, discreetly, and anonymously at times when you need some extra support. When you use a mental health app, you don't have to grapple with making appointments, wait lists, or insurance. On top of that, lots of apps offer creative and fun ways to manage mental health, so you might have some fun when you use them. Importantly, there is also building evidence that these apps are effective in helping people manage mental health challenges. In some cases, they can be as effective as traditional treatments like therapy. Smiling Mind aims to help users achieve better mental health and balance through mindfulness and meditation. There is a lot of content for both adults and youth on the app. There are programs for teenagers and the unique challenges they face, as well as programs for kids under 12. There are a number of tracks aimed at helping people deal with stress in the classroom for both students and educators. Each session lasts anywhere from 1 to 10 minutes and can be completed at any time. Users can favorite their programs or sessions to find them easily later and set notifications to remind them to meditate. Users can also download tracks while they are connected to the internet, which they can access later, even if they are offline. We've reviewed Smiling Mind at One Mind Cyber Guide, and it receives a score of 4.67 out of 5 on credibility and a score of 4.84 out of 5 on user experience. Join us again next week for another app review and visit onemindcyberguide.org to learn more about mental health apps. Thank you, CyberGuide team. And thank you to Dr. Francis Collins, Dr. Indre Viscontes, and Dr. Deanna Barch for sharing their insights and wisdom with us on today's show. Viewers, thank you as well for watching and participating. Your, your participation makes a huge difference to our show and to the communication of science. Viewers, uh, don't forget, you can post questions and also check out all of our past episodes at onemind.org slash brainwaves, where you can also subscribe to our newsletter, where you can learn about new episodes of Brainwaves that come out week upon week. Thanks, everybody, for watching and participating. I'll see you next week. And remember, what are our brains good for? Making waves, of course. Bye. Take care.
My mother has had depression uh, most of her life. My uncle committed suicide when he was in his 30s. I live with bipolar. Now more than ever, it's the world's leading cause of disability. Yet research to improve mental health lacks the attention physical health research receives. Visit OneMind.org. From the lab to the front lines, accelerating brain health for all. Help us fund new treatments at OneMind.org.